Let's go! It's the L.A. Football Podcast. Touchdown Ram! Recovered by the Chargers. Touchdown UCLA! With USC great and NFL stud, Frosty Rucker. The Trojans back in front. And LAFB founder, Ryan Zyrood. On the Believe Podcast Network and LAFBnetwork.com. This is your destination for Los Angeles football. Los Angeles, what's going on? Welcome back to the Believe in LA Football podcast here on the Believe Podcast Network and LAFBnetwork.com. I am your co-host, Ryan Diver, joined as always by the great Frosty Rucker. What's up, man? How you doing? The great. I love that. I'm good, man. You are the great. The greatest. I am the great. Yeah. So what up, Ryan? What up, LA? Not much, man. We're doing good. Finally, uh, I don't know how it is down where you are, but it's been pretty... What, what smoky i guess i should say with all the fires and i'm finally seeing some sunlight out my window so that's been that's been nice yeah i checked the air today it was moderate so I'm, uh, i get to get outside and get some exercise so i'm yeah. happy about that your little backdrop with like it's supposed to be like a pretty sunset but that's what it's actually looked like just yeah with it's a little hazy. Of the fires yeah a little hazy i um, see that's already happening i foreseen it yeah that's right you predicted it what four weeks ago five weeks ago so um <laughs> But happy to be here. We got a great show for you today. And speaking of hazy, we do have a new beer sponsor. We're excited to announce uh, that Golden Road Brewing is our newest sponsor of the show. Uh, the brew was founded in 2011. It's in Los Angeles, and it's the largest craft brewery uh, with brew prep locations in L.A., Sacramento, Atwater Village, and close to you, Frosty, down in Anaheim and Huntington Beach for all those yeah. Orange County listeners. Yeah, we're going to have to link up and uh, have a beer. That's right. We absolutely will. So uh, well, I think we're going to be doing some live shows as well once COVID permits. Uh, so we'll have to hang out and meet. Um, they got great beers specifically for the show. They have a Bolt Up Golden Ale, which I actually have with me right here for you, Charter Look fans. And they also have a uh, Who's House Rams beer, Rams Ale. So uh, they got both teams covered. So a perfect sponsor for the LA Football Podcast. So big thanks to them. And we're going to have a lot of fun with it throughout the season. So um, but we got a great show for you today. As mentioned, it is our preview show. Um, we did it last week. We got it this week. We got two guests for you, except we're going a little different this week. We're going to invite opposing beat writers onto the show. So we're going to have Zach Berman. He is the beat writer for the athletic for the Philadelphia Eagles. So Rams fans, you'll be able to get some insight there from him. And then for the Chargers Chiefs games, we're going to have Bob Fesco, who is a radio host on 610 Kansas City. Um, so he can give us some more insight to the Chiefs. So I think it'll be nice to have a little cross-reference there because uh, I think Frost and I, I think we know what we're talking about, but, you know, it helps have those guys that are in those camps um, give us what to expect from their teams, yeah? Yeah, it's just an insight for our fans. You know, you want to know the other team that we're playing just so we're not fooled or shocked. Uh, when the product's on the field Sunday, you already get a little heads up of who's looking good, who practiced, who didn't, and you come here first, LA Football Network. That's right. You said it. So um, we're going to get right into that. We're going to start with our uh, Rams-Eagles interview and then end with the Chiefs-Chargers. Uh, before we do, also got to mention our other online partner, which is betonline.ag. Um, first, Frost, did you watch that uh, Nuggets-Clippers Game 7? Of course. Yeah, Nuggets uh, came back. Uh, yeah, I mean, Is that the first time in NBA history, between two you series down 3-1? Yeah, between you and I, I got one of my best friends, Nick, are such Nuggets fans, and we've been waiting for this moment so you guys could play the Lakers, like I said, you guys. Yeah. Um, to go back and listen to all the jibber-jabber all season, then season stopped, and you guys started over, and all of a sudden you guys are in the Western Conference Finals, and we're just waiting for you guys. So I hope you guys aren't tired playing seven games. and. <laughs> You You're know, not going to let gonna, me live that no, way. No, no, right? I'm not. I'm not. This is game week. Uh, I'm not uh, patting you on your back for getting there. Now you guys got to compete. Well, hey, well, I know this, we do football, but maybe we'll have to get together and have a golden road during one of those games since uh, yeah, why not? Nuggets game. Last time they played was RIP when Kobe and Melo showed off in the Western Conference Finals. I think it was like 2008 or something. So right. it's, it, it's been a while for my Nuggets, but they're back. But anyway. I digress. Just had to ask. Um, so that's a game we could bet on. I probably will head to bet online, look for some bets on that. Um, but there's plenty of game spreads, totals, uh, player and coaching props. One of the props I saw was how many coaches over under get fined for not wearing their mask correctly this week. Something fun. Wow. 
throw money on. Sean McVay, unfortunately, was one of the biggest culprits of that in week one. So he came out and apologized. Um, but go ahead to betonline.ag today. Take advantage of all the great sign-up bonuses. Again, that's betonline.ag and sign up today. BetOnline is your online sportsbook experts. So let's go ahead and jump right into it. Here is our guest, Zach Berman of The Athletic. All right, Rams Nation, got a great guest for you for this week's matchup as the Los Angeles Rams travel to Philadelphia to face the Eagles. We are joined by Zach Berman. He is a beat writer for the Philadelphia Eagles for The Athletic. Zach, my man, what's going on? Doing well. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely. Zach, this is Frosty Rucker. So, uh, Pats or Genos? <laughs> uh, you know, I actually like Jins and Del Sandras. Ooh. Are, are two spots that like I, I I can go on down the list. Pats and Genos are good, but um, you know when you live here, there there are a lot of options. So uh, <laughs> my favorite's at Del Sandro's, but but uh, you 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 can't go wrong anywhere again. Good to hear. Good to hear. So I'm gonna dive into this. I want to ask you the first question out the gate: a 17 point deficit. How, how does that happen with a well coached Eagles team on the first outing out? Yeah, good question. There, there's a there. Are, are a lot of ways you can go. First of all, uh, they had two bad turnovers. Carson Wentz, well, they had three bad turnovers, but uh, two interceptions from Carson Wentz, uncharacteristic plays, uh, and and that does a big part of it. I mean, I mean, Washington scored five times, and all five drives started on the Eagles' side of the field. So that kind of shows you the way the game was going. This this wasn't a collapse from the Eagles' defense. This was a collapse from the Eagles' offense. Uh, they they let up eight sacks. That was the most since Carson Wentz has become the quarterback. They were playing with a patchwork offensive line against a really good defensive line. Uh, nonetheless, they made mistakes along the way. It was whether it was Carson Wentz at quarterback, whether it was Doug Peterson's play calling, whether it was the offensive line. There was there was a lot of blame to go around, but really it falls on the offensive shoulders. Yeah, you, you alluded to it a little bit, and I'm just curious your opinion on it. Obviously, a patched-up offensive line, but do you think those eight sacks were more of a Wentz trying to do too much, holding the ball too long, or do you think it was just that superior defensive line really you know, going up against that patchwork offensive line? Yeah, I'd say a little bit of both. Um, you know, Carson Wentz, there were times when, when he took sacks he should not have taken, no question. That being said, uh, part of the appeal of Carson Wentz, part of the reason you want him as your quarterback is his creativity and, 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 and the fact that he can improvise. So he, he's never going to be the type of quarterback that's just like snap and throw. Um, so there's a part of that comes with the package. Now, now the offensive line, uh, they had two new starters on, on the right side. Uh, but it wasn't just that. Jason Peters had a tough day, and he's a future Hall of Famer. And the other thing I'll say, and then this probably isn't getting enough attention, is they were playing without running back Miles Sanders. And mm-hmm. Miles Sanders uh, really helps them in terms of blitz pickup. And I, I think you saw the problem there because there were times that the running backs in the backfield, whether it was Boston Scott or Corey Clement, um, they were kind of at, at fault for the sacks as well, including a bad fourth down sack where – they just didn't pick up the free blitzer. Very true. Sanders is a game breaker, so um, they missed him dearly. I have a question, though. Do you think Carson Wentz is um, afraid to run the ball? I don't. I think that he he uh, he's obviously looking to throw the ball more than run. Um, he has said that. Uh, I, I think if we were talking about the team two years ago, when Carson was coming off the torn ACL, he was a little bit more reluctant to run. I think last year he got back to that, that 2017 Carson. Um, and when he, he ran in 2017, uh, it was obviously very helpful, very good for him and for the offense. But he also tore his ACL against the Rams. Um, and, and so there's, there's a handful of different ways you can look at it. I don't necessarily think that running will lead to injuries. Uh, that's a debate that you often hear in Philly. They've been having that debate for a while since, since, um, since Michael Vick was, was, was playing mm-hmm. quarterback. Um, but, but the way I see it, like you look at, at, at Kyler Murray with the Cardinals, you can run and not take big hits. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the key isn't the scrambling. The, the key is avoiding the big hits. And there are times when Carson invites contact as opposed to avoiding contact. 
and that's something he needs to do a better job with here in, in year five. But to answer your question, I don't think he's reluctant to run, but I think he's looking to make plays with his arm. Yeah, yeah, and unfortunately, that you know that horrible ACL injury happened out here in Los Angeles in his uh, almost MVP would have probably been an MVP season had he wrote out the season. But uh, you know, speaking of Wentz, speaking of Goff. Whether they like it a lot, not whether fans like it a lot, those two players will live in infinity together, being the number one, number two draft pick in the same class, along with Dak. You know, we always have the history of guys like Marino and Elway and uh, Eli, Ben, and, and Philip Rivers. And so now we have these two guys. Out here in L.A., I feel like that's actually a pretty big thing. Like, L.A. Rams fans are always, you know, reluctant to say Carson Wentz is in the same echelon on Goff. They're Goff guys. That's their guy. I'm curious, out in Philly, is that a thing? Do they, do they kind of hate on Goff, or is it more of a, you know, Philly does their own thing and doesn't really care about L.A.? I don't think it's, it's that Philly doesn't care about L.A., but I, I think it's, it's, it's more Wentz, Dak Prescott in Philly mm-hmm. because the Cowboys are in the division. They see them twice. And the other thing with, with uh, Wentz and Goff is it's probably, it's probably more – of a thing in L.A. way because they had a choice. You know, the Eagles didn't have a choice. They traded the number two that year. Uh, and even though they say they were happy with, with Goff or, 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 or Wentz, um, I'm pretty sure that, that, that they were fairly certain the Rams were taking Goff when they made that trade. Uh, but they did do a, a lot of work on, on Goff, and they did like Goff. I think Eagles fans w- would, would tell you that they probably prefer to have Wentz than Goff. Um, but they're, they're different types of quarterbacks. And frankly, I, I think that like, uh, personality wise, they probably fit best in their market. Uh, so it worked out for both players. Interesting. Interesting. So a question for you, uh, on your scouting report, it says that the running back Sanders got back to practice and went full yesterday. Um, any news out of camp that says that, um, he's going to play or is it just a, a good sign that him and Lane Johnson are back? Yeah, so I, I, I think he's, he's going to play. He's on track to play. Frankly, I think he probably could have played last week if it was, you know, a playoff game or, or a game like that. I, I think with a hamstring injury and a, and a running back, they wanted to be cautious. And we mm-hmm. want, perhaps they exercise that, that same caution in week two, but uh, he's a full participant in, in practice. I'd be surprised if he's not out there. Perfect. Yeah. I know a lot of fantasy owners will be happy about that too, but uh, yeah. speaking of the Rams, they would love probably not to see Miles Sanders because of how dynamic he is. And speaking of dynamic playmakers, uh, the Rams face another one this week in Deshaun Jackson. Uh, I thought Jalen Ramsey did a pretty good job against Amari Cooper last week. Uh, he did get his catches, but they held him under hundred yards. Jackson, I feel like probably wasn't as involved in the game plan last week. Maybe that was just because of stuff that happened throughout the game after starting to fall behind. Um, but what do you expect from these, you know, Philly playmakers, Deshaun Jackson, Jalen Rager, guys like that. How do you expect them to be more involved against a pretty good Rams secondary highlighted by Jalen Ramsey and that three-headed safety attack they showed against the Cowboys? Yeah, so, so Deshaun is someone who, uh, I mean, he's a, he's, a, he's a game breaker, obviously. He's not a high-volume player, mm-hmm. but he can stretch the field. They're a different offense when he's out there. Him and, 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 and Jalen Rager, what the Eagles want is that vertical threat. Uh, Deshaun only took about 50% of the snaps last week. The Eagles want to manage him. He was he only finished one game all year last year, 33 years old. The Eagles want to make sure that they can do everything they can to get him through the season. I, I would assume that he plays more on Sunday, but I, I still think the Eagles are going to try to be smart with him. To be completely honest, when you're preparing for the Eagles, uh, I, I, I don't think, and I'm not a, a defensive coordinator here, but I, I don't think you're you're starting with Deshaun. I, I think what you're doing is you're looking at Zach Ertz and Dallas Goddard. And, and those two tight ends and the way the Eagles use those tight ends, uh, that's, that's how this offense is built. I mean, they played more 12 personnel last week than any team in the NFL. Uh, they were over 50% in, in, in 12 personnel. So, so I, I think what that shows you is, is these two tight ends, what they want is if, 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 if the Eagles offense is clicking, they have speed on the outside, and that opens up the middle of the field for the tight end. Uh, so I would really you, – you mentioned the three safety package that the Rams had. I would really pay attention to how they do handling the tight end. Yeah, because looking at Zach Ertz's uh, stat row last, last game, he didn't really get involved too much. He did get a touchdown, but, you know, that guy needs to at least get at least eight catches a game, in my opinion, because he is a game breaker. So I think with Sanders coming back, we'll balance the, the run – the, the pass out of the backfield, getting Ertz and Deshaun Jackson free. So um, 
I think good luck. I think it's a, it'll be a, a better game. Yeah, I'm 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 real curious to see. I mean, I mean, with the way the Eagles played last week, they 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 badly need to rebound. Um, there's there's a lot going on in Philly in terms of injuries. Uh, so they they're still waiting to see what their defensive line looks like. Brandon Graham's in the concussion protocol. Uh, Derek Barnett, uh, he he didn't play week one. They're they're hoping he's out there week two. Uh, and you know, a, a, a defensive tackle, Javon Hargrave, who was their big free agent signing, he uh, just started practicing this week for the first time. So there's still a lot in the air with the Eagles injury-wise, but they they obviously need to get rolling after an unexpected loss. Yeah, Zach, you kind of you kind of beat me to my my final question because I was going to bring up the defensive line, and you kind of alluded to the injuries they have there. Um, you know, first of all, the NFC East just seems loaded at the defensive line. You know, the Washington obviously probably one of the best, underrated in the entire league. Cowboys are great, Eagles are great, um, and the the Rams were able to last week kind of neutralize that by you know the screen game. Obviously, ran the ball forty times. They opened up the play action, and they got the ball out of Goff's hand very quick. That was kind of one of the big detriments last year was him hanging on the ball too long. So that's what they emphasized last week. So, how do you expect with the injuries and with everything going on, the Eagles' defensive line to hopefully for you guys, maybe not for us, but hopefully kind of attack that and either force Goff to hold on to the ball longer or shut down the screen and running game so they can really go after this offensive line that is probably the biggest question mark on this Rams, at least offense and probably even the whole team. Yeah, so with the Eagles, really, their defense is, is, is built around getting pressure with the four-man rush. Uh, now, now they, they, they do blitz from time to time, and in Jim Schwartz, in, in, his, in his time in Philly, they've increased their, their blitzing every year. But the way the defense is built, and all you have to do is, is look at their salaries, um, all their big money players on, on, on defense for the most part are on the, are on the defensive line. Uh, so they're going to try to get pressure with, with four men. They, they have three of the, of, of the 10 highest paid defensive tackles in the NFL. Now, obviously the best defensive tackle in, in, in the NFL is on the Rams. But when you look at, at the Eagles defensive line between Fletcher Cox, Malik Jackson, uh, Javon Hargrave, if he's out there, they, they, they have guys, who uh, who can get interior pressure, and then they're still figuring out their defensive end situation. Uh, but what the Eagles will 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 try to do is beat you with that interior pressure, and I, I think that's that's maybe one of the keys to the game. Yeah, huge huge uh, matchup for this interior offensive line, and I'm glad you brought up. Uh, well, now I'm drawing a blank name, but you brought up a player that I totally forgot that the Eagles even had. So yeah, they have so much depth and greatness there in the interior. So it'll be a huge matchup for uh, this game and for this Rams team. So, uh, well, Zach really do appreciate you taking some time, giving us and our Rams fans some insight for what to expect from the Eagles. seems like it's always a great game every time these two teams meet and I'm sure we're in for another treat. So Zach Berman of the athletic. Thanks so much, man. Really appreciate it. Anytime. Thanks for having me on. Thanks, Zach. All right. Well, that was fun having Zach on getting some, uh, um, inside from that, Malik Jackson. I don't know why I just like brain farted when I was trying to say his name, but Malik Jackson yeah. is who I was talking about. Former Bronco, then Jaguar. I totally forgot he was even on the Eagles. Um, so that's another big, big name uh, to look out for. Absolutely. And I think uh, that defensive front, um, like you said, that's where all the money is. And that's where we need to be focusing in on the Rams um, offensive line, obviously going into the season. They're the big question mark or the big circle around how they can keep golf up. This has usually been when you, you're facing a, a great defensive front like they're about to face is where we all got to pay attention to how quick golf gets rid of the ball, um, what the running backs are going to do, and if he can get the ball down the field. But the pressure is going to come from the interior, um, always starting with Fletcher Cox, man. What a hell of a player. Yeah, no, yeah, Fletcher Cox, one of the best in the business, been doing it forever. Um, I, I feel like every year it's between, I mean, I always am biased. I'll say it's always Aaron Donald, but it's always between those two guys as the top interior. You could throw Calais in there who kind of plays both little interior outside, plays different techniques. But right. um, yeah, going to be a great game. I had this one all off season. We both did kind of circled as one of our favorite matchups. I, I mentioned it in the interview. I've always loved the Wentz golf storylines, maybe more so than other people do. Maybe I build that up too much, but I just think it's always fun. Um, after the last week though, with the Rams beating the Cowboys, playing very well. We talked about extensively last episode how the defense played great and with the Eagles really falling apart against a Washington football team that a lot of people had pegged for us outside of the defensive line, not a very good team. And they ended up putting up, giving up 27 points, losing that game. So Frost, how do you see this game going? Do you like the Rams traveling out East? 
I do. I think they don't have to deal with the crowd noise. All you're, you're going to mm-hmm. deal with is the elements of being in a different place, different environments, and outside stadium. They're not playing in, indoors. Um, I like I like their chances. Um, I think both teams have a chance to concentrate without those heckling Eagles fans that don't give you a break. They don't give their offense a break when you're there. They don't give their defense a break, you know, especially the other teams. So um, the Rams took care of business last week. Going into this one, I think they'll do the same. They'll stay on point. They'll get it done. Um, I do see a very physical game and a lot better because I know – because the Eagles are a well-coached uh, team, and then they're getting a, a couple players – back on the offensive side of the ball, helps them move the chains, helps them, gives them a chance to win. Um, Lane Johnson coming back, second game for uh, Peters playing at tackle because, remember, in training camp, he played at yeah. guard the whole time. Yeah. So um, dusting the, the dust off his shoulders a little bit and his pads and, you know, learn how to do that kick slide a little bit better and get back to what he does. He'll be shut down, and, you know, he has a, a big task in hand, too. Um, I think the matchup is more even, but – I do see the Rams running away with this just off. Uh, I think the defense will be playing a lot better um, coming off momentum from beating Dallas and the Eagles have enough to prove that they will be challenging, but they fell apart and there's something wrong with that when your team falls apart like that. Yeah, no, I agree. Uh, it's going to be a good game, a Super Bowl winning team, uh, you know, the year before the Rams went. So still a lot of those players on this roster. Um, we talk about the trenches all the time as a big matchup, and it's going to be that every year just because of the, you know, not every year, every game, just because of uh, the, the Rams offensive line who played very well. They were rated really well um, statistically yes, last did. year by PF. So we got to give them credit, hats off. But it's still, you're going up against a formidable defensive front. Um, I too do like the Rams. Don't want to sound biased, but I just think they showed so much against a, I, to me, the Cowboys at this point are a better team than the Eagles until proven otherwise. And the Rams showed out, played great against the Cowboys. You know, it's any given Sunday. Every week's a different week, different team, different matchup. Um, but I do like the Rams. For me, the biggest matchup, and uh, our guest alluded to it, is covering those tight ends. So how these safeties or linebackers or, or whoever Staley draws up to cover both Zach Ertz and Dallas Goder, because remember this team probably runs the most 12 personnel out of any NFL team. Dallas Goder actually led every tight end last week statistically, had a great, great game. So you think Zach Ertz is the guy, which he is on paper by his paycheck, but Dallas Goder, you know, third-year guy out of South Dakota State, is just as good or just as potent, but you have to cover both of them. So that's going to be, for me, the biggest matchup, if it's Jordan Fuller, if it's Taylor Rapp, if they're going to try a linebacker, Mike Kaiza, but if they're able to sustain those uh, tight ends, then I really do like the Rams in this one. So I, I'm taking the Rams as well. Um, do we want to give uh, score projections or just, just go with a win? I'll say a win. <laughs> I don't want to give yeah. a score projection right now. You know, I, I just look at the stat rail and I, I just know that Ertz wasn't a key factor in that game, even though he had a touchdown. But like mm-hmm. you said, he's the other guy that really got busy and – that's a good thing for Eagles fans. They got two potent tight ends that can create Mitch matches that a lot of teams don't have. So um, how the Rams defend that, that's going to be unique. Um, I think the DBs will be up for it. I think they're going to blitz Wentz a lot um, and get him out of that pocket, get him moving and um, see what he's all about, you know, because before you know it, you know, Eagles fans, um, they're going to be screaming from their TVs about Jalen Hurts getting in. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. Eight sacks last week, you know, Aaron Donald and Leonard Floyds and Ed Cam, all those guys are licking their chops right now, hopefully hitting that stat sheet. So. And coach um, Eric, he's going to have those guys ready, you know, dog Eric, work, baby. That's right. Coach Henny, coach yeah. Henny, they'll be ready. So can't wait for that Sunday game. Going to be great. Uh, but yeah, Frost and I both have the Rams coming out the victory. So I think that's a, a good thing. Hopefully we don't, we don't want to be biased, but I feel like every week we're going to, we're going to side with our, our guys. We'll see. We'll see what happens next. Well, until they prove us wrong. Right? There you go. They want to know. So we got to go with yeah. them. Confidence is on our side right now with our LA team. So let's just keep it rolling. That's right. 2-0. and And we're undefeated in college football. So we can't, can't complain with that. <laughs> so speaking of touch ma- tough matchups and great tight ends, the Chiefs have a really, really good one. Super Bowl champions are coming to LA to face the Chargers. So let's go ahead now and transition and get into our interview with our uh, Chargers get, or excuse me, our Chiefs guest to help us break down the Chargers and Chiefs game. All right, Chargers fans. Well, excited to bring in our next guest as we preview the Chargers' first game at the beautiful SoFi Stadium as they welcome in the Super Bowl champion Kansas City Chiefs. We welcome on Bob Fesco, host of Fesco in the Morning on six ten Sports Radio in San Diego, or excuse me, Kansas City. Uh, Bob, what's going on? 
Hey, man, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. I'm, I'm really looking forward to, uh, to this game. And, you know, I'd love to say, you know, we were going out there and watching this game in person, but obviously that can't happen. But it's still, it's an AFC West game, man. I'm looking forward to this. Yeah, Bob, this is the new norm, so you get used to it. We can we can do live and, and have a couple beers, too, if you like. <laughs> yeah, I'm all yeah, in already, on that. I already started, so we're good. We got our bolt-up <laughs> beer right here. We're good to yeah. go. Ryan's on the road. Where's that bolt up beer from, Ryan? Again, what Golden Road that? Brewery. We're dropping that name all day. It's funny, Bob. When we talked before we hit record about uh, being out in Radio Row, and your guys—I don't know if it was you too, but your afternoon guys had a barbecue fountain on their yeah. Table. And so yeah. that was like the big sponsor, and I freaking love that. So maybe we'll have a Golden Road beer fountain once we're once we're live again. Well, interesting about Golden Road Brewery is that they actually made the um, the, the the Chiefs beer that's here in Kansas City. The, right. uh, well, I forget go. what the name of it is, like the, the the Champions Ale or whatever it's called, but I know it was Golden Road Brewery. I think I'm it's drinking like my Kingdom BLK Ale. water. Yeah, the, the Kingdom Ale. That's yeah. what it was. The Kingdom Ale is uh, is what we have out here in Kansas City. So you said Golden Road Brewery, and I've done enough research on those guys, man. They started out small and got really really big and they're living the dream they did exactly what we all want to do somebody pays you a lot of money to go away you know and that's exactly what happened with that they got bought out right yeah now they're sh shipping us beer so it's mm -hmm. a win-win for everyone that's right so we'll have yeah. a good soon so uh well bob let's start first with uh you know your week one matchup with houston just briefly and then we'll get obviously to uh our charters matchup since that's what we're focused on but Chiefs look like they're rolling on all cylinders. Obviously, not a lot of turnover for them. Uh, it's, I feel like it's rare that a Super Bowl winning team doesn't lose any big name guys. And it seems like for the most part, obviously, a few guys opted out in a, you know on the offense or one guy on the offensive line, and obviously some injuries there in the secondary for you. But overall, pretty much the same supporting cast there. So, what did you like about that game besides the win? But what do you think the Chiefs did very well to you know regain that this dominance that they have already? Well, I think what it's going to sound weird. Patrick Mahomes looked normal in that football game. He didn't have to True. be a 50 touchdown guy. He didn't have to be a guy that had to make the big play. He only threw for 211 yards. Three guys got into the end zone, passing touchdowns. Clyde Edwards Hilaire came onto the scene. And I think what we're seeing now is Patrick Mahomes kind of morph into this like uh, point guard at quarterback where he just has to distribute the ball. He doesn't need to make the big play because he's got so many weapons around him that can make the big play. He just has to get it to him and let him go. And the addition of Clyde Edwards Hilaire at running back you know, replacing Damian Williams, who opted out, and, and Kalechi Osemele on the offensive line, replacing Laurent Duvernay-Tardif. They actually got better at those positions with the guys opting out and the replacements yeah. that they have in there for them. And so th this team is just rolling along, man. And, you know, I watched a lot of week one, as I'm sure you guys did as well. And the Chiefs just look better than everybody else out there. And that's because they've got 18 to 22 starters back and nobody left from the coaching staff after the Super Bowl. Yeah, they looked like they were just rocking and rolling, like they were just playing another game onto that 2019 season, right? It just seemed like the next game up. And uh, like you said, the additions of the running back and big KO uh, in the middle of that offensive line, uh, it's really put you guys in position to be very strong for the long haul. Well, KO has been a big addition for us. Oh, I, I mean, you know, today uh, after practice for the second time this season, you know, Eric Bieniemy, the offensive coordinator, used the term competitive prick to describe a player. And that was <laughs> yeah. originally about Patrick Mahomes. And now he's saying that about KO because this dude's just nasty, I guess, man. I, I wouldn't want to be out there on the field with him coming at me. He's like just destroying people in his way, you know? Bob, I, I, I played versus him when he was in Baltimore. I was on the same team with him in Oakland. Uh, training camp was nasty. <laughs> you know, we got into it a little bit, but that's just who he is by nature. It doesn't matter if it's a game or practice. That guy brings it. He has attitude. And bringing that, uh, that force and that attitude to that offensive line gives that offense a, a great balance, you know. Uh, obviously, the run game clicked last year. They won it all, right? But with him being an addition, I think they just become seamless and they can just keep doing their thing. He's healthy. I mean, you guys got a good one in that one. Yeah, no doubt. And and it really has kind of secured that offensive line. I mean, everybody's using, like I said, that term nasty for these guys. And it's almost like nobody was nasty last year, but now they're all playing nasty this yeah. year. And they've got a running back that they can rely on, a bunch of wide receivers and a tight end that's maybe the best in the business. And you've got a quarterback that nobody can touch. And he's celebrating his 25th birthday today on the exact day that the NFL was founded. So I think it was meant to be for us finally here in Kansas City. Yeah. Heaven, he's a heaven. Light guy, right? What's that? He's a Bud Light guy, right? Uh, he got a Coors Light cake. Coors Light. Coors Coors Light. Coors Light. Yeah, yeah. He's a Coors Light guy. He's a Coors Light guy. Yeah, he got a big Coors guy. Light cake. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't you say Denver. that out loud. Yeah. Bite your tongue. <laughs> uh, but yeah, yeah. The Chiefs, you know, heaven's, heaven's looking pretty red right now for them. And, and before we get into 
the matchup. Uh, I'm just curious, Bob, Eric Bieniemy. you mentioned him. Is he going to be a head coach next year? It's crazy that he still is not a head coach in this league. I know he's not a long-time offensive coordinator, but what he's done with that chief offense is pretty remarkable. Do you think he's a head coach next year? He's a special dude, but let, let me ask you this. Would you rather be the offensive coordinator with Patrick Mahomes or the head coach of the Browns? You know, like, like th those are like the questions that you're totally. getting because those are the teams that you're going to, you know, it's, it's not like you're taking over the chiefs, you know, uh, Andy Reid just signed up for whatever it was five more years or however long the extension was. And so I, I, I would have to ask myself and I know, look, hey, you're a competitive dude. The salaries are outrageous. You want to be that head coach in the NFL, but would you rather be a head coach in the NFL for the Bengals or would you rather be the offensive coordinator for Patrick Mahomes and what's going on here in Kansas City, knowing you're going to have a job, knowing you're going to be celebrated, knowing you're going to make big plays? I mean, you know, for me, I, I kind of would just hang out here and be the offensive coordinator. But I think he wants to be a head coach, and I think he should be a head coach. Mm -hmm. But if this team keeps winning and they keep going to the Super Bowl every year, our team's going to wait and want to interview him after that. And, you know, because a lot of guys want to already get their, their coach in place by the time, you know, the championship weekend rolls around. All right. I feel like if he stays at OC and they keep winning, like you're saying, they just keep doing it and doing it, um, he's going to drive the coaching uh, plateau with salaries up by the time he he's going to break the bank on them because he's going to be the most sought out guy. Usually they're already picking guys from teams, but right now, what are the options for him? Like you just said, yeah. stay where you're at. Jacksonville, maybe. Yeah. Who knows? Yeah, but yeah. again, that's a rebuild. You're rocking and rolling right now. You want to get rings under your belt because again, his status goes up and his resume is going up at the same time. So he will one day and. Can't wait to see that happen because he, he's deserving of it. No, he definitely is. He He's dynamic, too. Like, that that's a dude that walks into the room and you're just, like, compelled to hear what he has to say. Like, mm -hmm. you're sitting on the edge of your seat. You want to hear everything that he's got to say. And I know the players love the hell out of him, too. So, it, yeah, the fact that he's not a head coach yet is kind of sad for him. But also, at the again, head coach of the Browns or offensive coordinator of the Chiefs, man. It's a, it's, I think it's an easy decision at this point. Yeah, and he's yeah. learning from Andy Reid the whole time too. That, that's you know, right, learning to pick more each other's more. brain and get better and better. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. That Andy Reid coaching tree is is something something special. I remember doing a report a year or two ago comparing, and this is nothing a knock on Belichick, but Belichick's coaching tree versus Andy Reid's, and it's it's uncomparable. Reid's guys just get it better when they move on to the next level, and and that speaks highly on Andy Reid, just the person he is, the coach he is, the mentor, the leader he is. Um, so we'll see that one day, but, but Bob looking now at this, at this Chargers matchup and obviously the Chargers are going to come into this game as the underdog. It's a home game, which doesn't mean much this year with no fans, but it is their first game at their new stadium down in Inglewood at SoFi, which uh, I wish you could see it, Bob, because it's a beautiful, beautiful spectacle, but you'll be able to see it on TV. And um, what, let's start with the Chiefs defense. So going against this Chargers offense that Frost and I talked about a lot less ep episode struggled a bit against the Bengals, but they're implementing a brand new offense with a new coordinator they have a brand new quarterback for the first time in like 14 years um they have a new set of stable running backs with melvin gordon now gone uh you know a turnstile at offensive line because they've already had injuries mike pouncey is probably gonna be out again this game but what do you look for the defense to kind of of the chiefs to hone in on to continue to slow down this Chargers offense? Well, and I think it starts up front. I think it really starts with, um, you know, guys up front that can get to the quarterback, whether it's Chris Jones or Frank Clark. And I, I don't know how much you guys really watched that first game and saw Frank Clark. It's mm -hmm. the fastest get up I've seen since Derek Thomas here in Kansas City. I, I haven't seen a guy get off the ball that fast in years. I mean, what he was doing, uh, uh, they faster than Tomba, man. And, and Tomba's my guy and Tomba was good and Tomba could get off the ball. But Thursday night, Frank Clark took it to a new level. He's ducking under offensive tackles. He's swatting these dudes out of the way like he's, he's special he, he really is and now he's healthy too man and and you know what that's like to be banged up and trying to play in the NFL and it's hard it's hard enough to play at full strength in the NFL and now Frank Clark is healthy and Chris Jones is healthy and 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 they've got like this chip on their shoulder that you know what nobody still respects us as a defense even though they've been a very good defense they finished top seven in the NFL last year in scoring so they've been a good defense but they're playing with this chip on their shoulder that nobody respects us nobody thinks we're any good and so they're trying to take that to the next level with Ty at the back end and their linebackers are solid as well with Anthony Hitchens so I think they got themselves a pretty good defense everybody wants to question the corners right now on this team you're playing with a rookie Legereus Sneed at one Traverius Ward we we don't know may play in this game mm -hmm. with a, with a broken hand but they were going to their fourth and fifth corner on Thursday night and not missing a beat I think that's a testament to Andy Reid and Steve Spagnolo and really Brett Feach for the way they draft and find players but then also coach those guys up 
Yeah, Frost, just a quick follow-up, Frost, before you jump in. But do you, Bob, expect uh, Tyron to be on Hunter Henry, who, when healthy, can be one of the top tight ends? Do you kind of expect Matthew to be covering him? I mean, I, I would imagine, man, because Ty's such a – just a unique individual both on the field and off the field. But on the field, like, he's a safety that will go out there and play man coverage too. We saw that in the Denver game last year in the snow. He kind of played a hybrid corner safety position. You're like, man, what's he doing out there? But, yeah, I, I would probably think – I mean, you know, the linebackers are not good matchups anymore for tight ends in this league, right? I mean, when, you, when you've got like a George Kittle or, a, you know, a, a, a guy like Kelsey, your tight end matchup versus the linebackers is just not good anymore. So you have to go with somebody quick or maybe a little bit smaller, but I think the safety matchup is the right way to go with Hunter Henry. Yeah, absolutely. He said it. I mean, he took it right out of my mouth, you know. <laughs> uh, Ty's such a dynamic player, and uh, I think that matchup will be the ball game. If Tyrod's not going down the field trying to stretch the field and, he, you know, he's not taking off or anything like that, it's going to be a tight end a matchup or it's going to turn into a run game. So, um, you know, it's going to be a good one. I think it's going to be a good one, you know, with Kansas City traveling out. No fans, doesn't matter, new stadium. Uh, everything's going to be locked in, and I like it. I like I, I like this game. I, I think it's going to be a good one. I like this game too. Look, the Chargers are the ones who give the Chiefs the most fits in the AFC West, and and mm-hmm. you know not that it's been. I think Andy Reid's twenty seven and three over the last five years against yeah. the AFC West, so he's had the number. But the Chargers always give this team fits. They've always found a way to play tight games. They've always found a way to get it down to the wire, and they've beaten the Chiefs on occasion. So I mean, you know, some people have said, "Oh, could this be like one of those games you overlook?" Not when Andy Reid's the head coach right now, because he puts so much emphasis on these division games and. You look on paper, man, Mike Williams, Keenan Allen, like, like the Chargers have got the ability to go downfield. And I think that's going to be interesting to see if they're able to test those cornerbacks of the Chiefs or if that defensive line with Tano Passigno on there now can get to the quarterback quick and not really have an effect on those corners playing on the back end. Yeah. Does it you, – you mentioned that. Does it concern you at all? And it's hard f- – for Chiefs fans and reporters, I feel like to be concerned at all about this Chiefs team with how good you are. But does it concern you at all considering the last time these teams met was a very different looking offense with Phillip Rivers, a statuesque quarterback, if you will, not mobile whatsoever. Um, he threw, what, three interceptions in that, Kansas, in that Mexico City game, I believe. One was a game-ending interception. And now, say what you want about Tyrod, but he brings a completely different element to the game with his mobility. We saw it last week, him being able to get out of the pocket, extend plays with his legs. So does that concern you at all that just the, the look of this offense is really something that they don't have a lot of tape on It's going to look completely different? I don't because of who they played last week and Deshaun Watson. And I thought they did a really good job against Deshaun Watson. Had Deshaun Watson been Phillip Rivers last week, the Chiefs probably would have set an NFL record with sacks. I mean, that's how often they were there and at the quarterback. I mean, they were there quick, but Deshaun is so good, man. Like like watching him and Patrick on the same field is just fantastic to watch. I hope Tyrod brings the same type of performance that Deshaun does. I love watching these quarterbacks play right now. I think this is the golden age of quarterbacks in the NFL. But, you know, from from a running standpoint, from a mobility standpoint, now I'm I'm not too worried about it just because of the fact that they did play Deshaun Watson last week and really kept him bottled up. So, okay. So now let's focus a little bit on the chiefs offense, which is, you know, we've mentioned how explosive dynamic it is. Um, Clyde's Edwards Hilaire, when they got him in the draft, I thought, great. The rich just get richer. Another amazing set piece for them to add. We saw how good they were when they had Kareem hunt. He leaves. Now they get a guy that could potentially be even better. What a dynamic, does he bring to this offense that either wasn't there or that he's able to just add to? Well, and, you know, when they drafted him, I'm not a I'm not a running back guy in the first round. I, I think the Andy Reid offensive system can find running backs and have done a great job with running backs. And then they get this guy who is just like incredible. Like he went into the season like he was a third year vet with the expectations that were on him and what everybody thought he was going to do and what he was going to be. And I'm like, man, they're really giving this guy a lot of praise and a lot of love. And then you saw what he did and he didn't even really factor into the passing game on Thursday mm-hmm. night against Houston. And that's what I can't wait to see. I can't wait to see him in the screen game, much like the Giants used Saquon Barkley the other night, in that screen game to try to open things up and had some success with it. I think the Chiefs can take Clyde Edwards-Alaire and and go to the next level in that screen game. So I'm anxious to see what he can do against the pass. But running the football, man, he was great. That touchdown that he had where he, Mm -hmm. you know, plants left and goes back right, the defensive back falls down. You're like, man, that's just special. He's just – he's so fun to watch right now. Yeah. But I feel like – I feel like the Chiefs are going to have set packages going for like weeks. Like week 10, we already got our package ready for the screens and whatnot because they're so dynamic and they run their screens with every receiver. The tight ends are running them. 
the offense, you just can't stop it, you know? And so the, the, the fact that they just ran the ball with him and he wasn't even effective in the passing game, I think that's something that people may be like, oh, he's just a runner. And then in two or three weeks, here comes a whole nother juggernaut of plays that they've already had waiting in the, in the vault, just yeah. ready to, <laughs> to let loose. You know, and, and Andy's had a lot of time by himself in the basement this year to draw up all of these things, right? He hasn't had anybody knocking on the door and coming into the office and stopping by to chat or anything like that. Like, he's had a lot of time. You know, he calls certain plays his Pat plays, and, and, and you got to think now he's got Clyde plays ready to roll too. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I would love to see Andrew Reed's vault full of tiny Bahama shirts and great plays. Yes. Um, you know, the, the NFL is – obviously, being a GM is extremely hard in the NFL or else we wouldn't just be sitting here at our desk on a Zoom call. But there's certain aspects of it that I feel like are simpler than they need to be. You look at a team like the Green Bay Packers who have – and this is really a question, more of just a statement. I'm kind of rambling here. But who have Aaron Rodgers at quarterback and in the first round draft Jordan Love, who now is third on their depth chart as opposed to taking a playmaker – um, not that they need a running back, but the Chiefs just say, hey, who's the next guy that's going to add to our already explosive offense? Let's not overthink this. Let's get the best guy on the board. And they go Clyde edwards helaire because I agree with you, Bob. I'm not a huge running back in the first round, but I don't think it, it's – overstated to say he adds just that much more dynamicness to this offense so no he he really does and and you know the, the Chiefs have done a really good job of not necessarily drafting for the now even they, they've always yeah. seemingly found a way to draft for the future because you know there will be a day where Tyree Kill ages out of the NFL where Travis Kelsey ages out of the NFL where Sammy Watkins ages out of the NFL and you need that next wave to start to come in and you also need dudes on their rookie contract to perform because you're paying 500 million dollars to the quarterback you know, you're paying how much money to the tight end, how much money to Frank Clark, how much money to Chris Jones, how much money to Tyron Matthew right now. So there's a lot of money out there. The draft is very important for this team in order to get a lot of those guys on the lower wage scale doing things that can be productive for this offense and this defense because you can't pay anybody. I say that and the Chiefs had $177 of cap space in February and they signed Patrick Mahomes to a half a billion dollar contract and they still have $13 million available to spend. How that happens, I don't know. Exactly. Yeah. Well, you know, Frosty, it's fake numbers, right? It's all just yeah. made up. It's monopoly money. Yeah. It is. Yeah, we see with the Rams every time. So it, it's crazy how they're able to manipulate those numbers. Um, but looking at the uh, receiving core, you mentioned Sammy Watkins, Tyreek Hill going up against a, in my opinion, maybe I'm biased, but a much better secondary with the Chargers with Casey mm -hmm. Hayward, who I believe got offensive or excuse me, defensive AFC player of the week last year, always grades out really good underrated. They bring in Chris Harris Jr. Um, who they're obviously familiar with because of his co career in Denver now just slides over to the Chargers. So much formidable more opponents this week and speaking specifically of Sammy Watkins, it seems like that I can remember at least the last two seasons, he goes off in week one and then kind of just disappears down the line. Is that something that you think they'll implement this or is it just they have so much riches on offense that they just every week it's a different guy up? It's, that's the question a lot of us have asked about Sammy Watkins. Like, where are you in week two, man? Like, what, yeah. what goes on? But, like, big games, big guys show up, big-time players show up in big games. And, and Sammy Watkins has been just unbelievable in the postseason. In the game against New England that they ended up losing, the couple of AFC playoff games this year. And then, of course, embarrassing Richard Sherman in the Super Bowl. And, like, this, this dude shows up in big games. And, and, and that's part of the reason why you want him on your team because he knows how to play big in big games. But also, so without Sammy Watkins out there, you know, Tyree Kill's never going to get open, right? They're just going to yeah. double and triple him and not have to worry about anybody else. You, you've got guys that they have to worry about, which presents matchup issues all over the field because you have to just to t say to yourself, who's beating us today? And allow that guy to go beat you because you just don't have enough people out there that can go defend these guys. Yeah. Yeah, tough. That's exactly it. I tough mean, task or matchups, you know, and someone has to be the, you know, sacrificial guy out there that's just going to get doubled and you know, get put in vice and then – it's who do you double on that offense? Right. And you know? who, do, who, who are you going to let be? I think like, like as a defensive coordinator, I think you go into that meeting on Wednesday and go, all right, we, we don't have a Who's going to beat us? Who, who, who are we going to allow beat us? All right, fine. We'll try it. We'll focus on Tyreek Hill and Travis Kelsey. If Sammy Watkins beats us or Demarcus Robinson beats us or if Nicole Hardman beats us, well, then fine, they beat us. But we can't I, – I think it's I think it has to be Hill and Kelsey right off the bat that you have to make sure they don't beat you. And if, then if they beat you, then you've had a bad day at work. Exactly. And I think they, they take the approach of saying who it is first so the fans and whatnot and the ownership don't get mad because if it's someone else, well, we stopped our guy. We, we knew we had to stop this guy. Right. They're, they're loaded. They're completely loaded. And um, I, I, I haven't seen anything like this since like the Rams, 
you know. Yeah. And, yeah, and that's why I say he's like a point guard on offense. Just distribute that football. And if Tyreek's double covered, all right, fine, give it to Sammy. I mean, they went deep to to Demarcus Robinson to start the game last week. I mean, so mm-hmm. so I mean, that's a wide receiver too that is quietly good. And you know, he had an opportunity to go sign as a free agent, decided to come back here to Kansas City. But I know there's other teams around the NFL that like him, but they like him a lot here in Kansas City. He adds depth and speed and 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 just keeps that depth moving forward with how many guys guys you have in your arsenal absolutely yeah and uh you said it bob and this is the last one for me talking to bob fesco uh fesco in the morning 610 sports radio in kansas city appreciate you taking the time but you you talk about travis kelsey or i mean you guys would probably say he's number one in the league Uh, i think it's hard to argue he's not at least top two top three um the biggest disadvantage for the chargers going into this game is no derwin james uh, yeah. We talk about it all the time, unfortunately. He gets hit with the injury bug. But when he's on the field, not only is the defense better, but specifically, Travis Kelsey's worse. I think in the game last year where Erwin James was on him, he finished with like 24 yards. And the week where he wasn't, he finished with 92 yards and a touchdown. So I would assume we're going to see a heavy dosage of Desmond King. They may even put Chris Harris Jr. on him a little bit. I know that they did that in Denver a little bit, actually. Um, but what do you expect from Kelsey? Do you expect him to be kind of the focal point of the offense? Because Andy Reid knows no Derwin James. We can go Travis Kelsey all day. I thought Travis played one of his best games of his career on Thursday night against the Houston Texans. He looked fast. He looked young. He looked thin. He looked ripped. He looked like Rick. He was ready to roll, right? Yeah. And he did. And he was making nice plays and getting open and breaking tackles and looking fast. And and so, I mean, I think the Chargers can try to put whoever they want on him. But I, I think Travis is like taking his game to the next level and is really focused on, you know, winning uh, winning again and running it back. I mean, that's been the slogan that they've had all year long since the, since the postseason ended. They're really committed at, at running this thing back and winning another championship. And I, I think it's going to be hard to stop a guy like Travis Kelsey because he may be one one of the most committed guys to trying to run this thing back. Yeah, definitely a leader on the team, leader across the league, a phenomenal athlete. Um, yeah, this is going to be a great matchup. Yeah, it's going to be a lot of fun, man. I, you know, mm-hmm. and, and it, it really, you know, from a football standpoint, every time the Chiefs get set to play the Chargers, it seems like a big name goes down and a certain changes the entire dynamic of the game. Mm-hmm. Since since moving to uh, to Los Angeles, they've had a lot of bad luck in the injury front, you know. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, Joey Bosa has take time out out of practice already as it is. I don't want to, you know, bash your team too much, but that that's also something that we need to highlight and circle because that's our, you know, him between him and Melvin it, or, or who we're counting on to get the job done, to, you know, to stop Mahomes back there. So he doesn't just throw the ball down the field. 15 times and set some records yeah you, you got to get to the quarterback you got to pressure Mahomes if he has all day to sit back there and pick this defense apart somebody's going to be getting open fast yeah yeah he doesn't need much time to do it but no. uh, anything more than two or three seconds and you're already a lost cause so uh well Bob Fesco Fesco in the morning on 610 sports radio in Kansas City really really do appreciate the time it's great talking to you and uh, I love the KCM hockey shirt you're repping Oh, yeah. It's, it's our minor league hockey team here in Kansas City. So, you know, they got some pretty cool uh, merchandise that they have out there right now. And they've changed the logo up and the colors up a little bit. So, yeah, Kansas City Mavericks is the, uh, is the, is the team. And, yeah, old school CC. Somebody asked me today, is that a CCM hockey no. shirt? And I'm like, no. Those are the does. sticks I always played with with CCM. I'm, I'm a big hockey guy. So, anytime yeah. I see any hockey, I'm like, I love it. Hockey guy. <laughs> so, well, Bob, thanks so much, man. Enjoy the game. Uh, hopefully, we'll have a good outcome. But it should be a good one regardless. Always is between these two teams. And uh, hopefully we'll uh, have you on again and talk to you soon. Anytime, guys. Thanks so much for having me. Thanks, Bob. All right. Big thanks to Bob. That was a lot of fun. But, yeah, we, we probably said it at nausea, and this is going to be a tough, tough game. But it should be a good one. Always is. Yeah, it's always competitive. Same division. Um, it just looks like the Chiefs are – they're really, really strong in the right areas. And hopefully the defense comes to play and gives, you know, the offense a short field. And, you know, like Coach Lynn said or – you know, Tyrod said they need to work on the red zone. They missed a couple times in Cincinnati. And if they can capitalize on those and the defense plays well, we can be looking at an interesting game come the fourth quarter. Yeah, no, absolutely. And and you kind of briefly mentioned Joey Bosa injury. So I just want to touch on the injury report real quick. Joey Bosa pops up on there with a, a tricep issue. I'm, I'm hoping it's just like a I don't want to call it routine, but a, a cautionary thing because he played the whole game, didn't hear anything after the game, so maybe just some tenderness, some soreness. Um, but Casey Hayward also popped up on it with a knee. 
Um, didn't hear anything about it being super serious, but it should be noted. And then again, on the offensive line, Trey Turner still not practicing. Mike Pouncey, we're hearing now it could be longer term than expected. Um, so we probably won't see him at center anytime soon. So unfortunate again for this Chargers team, a lot of big name guys on that injury report. Yeah, but hopefully the other guys just step up. You know, it, it all takes uh, a part of a good great game plan. If we get a good game plan going forward and we know how to get the ball out of Mahomes' hands, sustain a lot of drives and eat up the clock so he can't put points on the board, again, like I said, in the fourth quarter, it could be a different different game. And um, hopefully the Chargers get there to the fourth quarter and minimize explosive plays. Yeah, yeah. So let me just ask you this quick for us as a defensive guy. How do you, because we didn't really talk about it, we were talking more of what to expect from KC, but how do the Chargers slow down this offense? Is it strictly on the pass rush getting after them, or what would you think is going on in that locker room being a guy that's um, played offenses of you know certain calibers? How do you slow a team like this down? I think they're so dynamic where, where they run plays. They can run the screen play that usually can get tackled, even if you have a third and long. It mm -hmm. should be tackled within six, seven yards, but these guys know how to break tackles. They block well down the field. Um, I think defense getting after my first and second down and getting off the field on third down, uh, the more punts Kansas City has, which they don't do often, the more they have and gives the ball to the offense. And if we can sustain a run game and eat the clock, short passes, move the chains, fill goals when needed, but you got to score touchdowns. You got to get in the red zone and score some touchdowns. So we're looking for the guys on the outside to take a ball, break some tackles, do something. We, we need a little – Keenan magic out there. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it is doable because, like I mentioned, in that Mexico City game, the Chargers were right in it. If not for Phillip Rivers' three interceptions, including the game clinching one in the end zone at the end, they could have been victors in that game. So they can definitely hang. They even added to the defense. I know a big loss in Derwin James, but they still have good talent back there. So it is doable. Um, and yeah, I expect the offense, Austin Eckler involved much more in the passing game, only one reception last week. So I think getting him involved early and often in the passing game um, and then keep feeding Joshua Killer the Rock to kind of, you know, slow down or tire out this Chiefs really good pass rush and defensive line. That's how you tire them out is just pounding the rock. And then that should open things up, hopefully for Keenan Allen and Mike Williams down the field. So that's got to be kind of the recipe to at least hang with these guys and, and hopefully – compete well we need a few explosive plays though you know there's not enough um there wasn't enough explosive plays for me last week so this week you need this explosive plays just to match at least the energy of the kansas city because you know that's in the game plan to go deep um the guys know when their numbers are called for screens and they know how to like i said earlier they block down the field really well and it's it, you know it's a, the missed tackles and whatnot so we need a clean game out of the chargers um and you know hopefully if it's a, it's a great game in the fourth quarter it can go in either way yeah, absolutely. And, you know, last thing, we didn't even mention special teams, who the Chiefs, led by Dave Tuber, one of the best special teams teams in the NFL. So they, wh whether they have Tyreek Hill, Michael Hold Hardman, or anyone else back there catching kicks and punts, that's going to be a huge thing for the Chargers to do is be able to stop those guys early, not give them, you know, positive yardage to have great field advantage for an already great offense. So there's just so many ways this team's going to attack you, and they just have to, you know, do the best they can to slow them down and then not have any self-inflicted wounds as well. Yeah. Again, they're both 1-0, so they're both full of confidence. Um, hopefully some guys can get off the injury report for the, our Chargers and make this a, a heck of a game for us. Yeah, absolutely. So we'll keep you posted on that injury report. Uh, keep it here with LAFB Network. Um, whether you're on social media or on the website, we'll update that for you. Um, but uh, Frost, great show. Big thanks to our guest, Zach Berman, for The Athletic Philadelphia, for giving us some Eagles insight, and Bob Fesco for the Fesco Morning Show on Sports Radio 610 in Kansas City for giving us some Chiefs insight. Hope everyone enjoyed the show. I think we're in for a great weekend of football, some great matchup, uh, great matchups for both of our teams. So, uh, Frost, where can everyone find you at? I'm at The Organic Frost, and that's on Instagram and Facebook. And you can email me at frostypodcast at yahoo.com. There you go. So hit him up. Hit me up at Ryan Dyrud, LAFB. You can email me at podcast at lafbnetwork.com. Love to hear your thoughts, questions, concerns, statements, anything. Uh, anything you want to talk about these games, we'll get into it next week on either Monday or Tuesday for some Mailbag Monday. So would love to have your thoughts about that. But enjoy the weekend, everyone. Stay safe, stay healthy, stay inside if it's hot and smoky, and uh, enjoy some football, and we'll talk to you guys all in a few days. See you later, LA. Stay safe.